Ruiz. Welcome back to the next part of this Truth and Rhythm episode. Be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. Also become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you so much for your interest and support. Enjoy. I've heard so many stories of, you know, American musicians going over there and just being floored, you know, that despite the language barrier, they know all the words and everything. It's yeah. It's got to be a kick to experience that. You know, it, it's fun now because people can see what I'm doing over all over the world because of the internet. But back then, it was psychological, right? I remember I was I had a lot of money because Japan and in, the, in those countries in Europe, I was it was the, the dollars were strong, the pound was strong, the yen was strong. I was loaded. I was making so. I remember going to Japan for two weeks and coming home and making you know two hundred thousand dollars and. And then I was there for only 14 days, and like, and in 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 the early 90s, that was a ton of money. And then, but but people would be like, I remember Steve Lukather. I I love Steve. Steve's my bro. Steve lived up the street from me. Me and Richie Cotson were neighbors, and Steve lived up the street. And, and Slash's dad lived across the street. And I remember um, Steve Lukather saying to Jimmy Dunlap, "Where's he getting all his money? Is he is he is he selling drugs? What's he doing? Because you know there was no internet, so nobody knew what the hell I was doing. But I was lying my fucking 500 SL Merc, and I was like, you know, I live in the Hollywood Hills, and, but everyone knew in America I was not selling records, and and I go on tour with Ten Strip, Darby, or Duran Duran, and Shred, probably you know five six thousand dollars a week. Um, I was making, I, you know, I was a top top dog session guy, and I was a top uh, more so music director for really cool acts, and so I was making that money. But that kind of money isn't that kind of money, you know. The, it's not a few money. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a lot of money. I don't mean to sound uh, uh, insensitive. It was a ton of money, but it wasn't like buy a mansion money, right? It wasn't like, you know, I don't know. And so people couldn't figure out why I was I had so much dough. And I had a beach house in San Diego, Carlsbad. And, uh, and it, was, but it was heartbreaking to me. I really wanted to be successful in America. I really thought what I was doing was valid. I really thought my music was great. Um, and I, I, I was making these records constantly and it's just, I was getting nowhere in America. Um, and you know, I, I remember I thought I was going to make it at one time. I had a song called start again. that was really doing well for me around the world. And, uh, if you ever see the video to start again, it's young Taylor Hawkins from the Who fighters playing drums. It was the first video we ever did. He's in the video with TM Stevens on bass and we shot it in New York and, and, um, I thought this song was a smash and I thought it was timely and it was doing huge business for me around the world, huge business for me around the world. And a guy called Charlie Miner, who was a huge record executive, heard it and he said, this is the number one record. It was during the time of, you know, Nirvana and all this, it was 94. And he goes, I want to manage you. And I'm like, oh, Charlie, Man Charlie Miner is going to manage me. I'm going to be successful in America. Finally, he's the most powerful record promotion guy in the world. And um, I get a call. Okay, Charlie wants to see you next Monday. Come on in, man. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, my life's going to change. It's going to fucking change. Because now I'm going to get a fucking platinum album in America. And now I'm going to really go into the fucking stratosphere. And um, that weekend, Charlie Minor got murdered. Wow. And it was all over the news. Uh, he had a girlfriend. I don't know if you ever heard the story. And she came into his house in Malibu. And he was with another girl. And she shot him. Killed him. And it was just like, not to sound self-centered, but it was like, and to think about myself because it was really horrible for Charlie but I said I am cursed I am cursed I'm never going to make it in America and I never did wow. I mean people and I got a lot of fans I guess but you know but I never made it in America yeah and it just seemed 
the, the, wasn't meant to be. The stars aligned so much, like quickly early on, but then that happened. But um, it, it, and they aligned for me all over the world. It's just I had to I, every 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 time I had to go play it was a twelve hour flight. I didn't care. I mean, if people want to see me in France, I'm going to France. But but I did really want to make it my home. I wanted, you know, I really wanted to to be successful in America, and it and it was a heartbreaking for me in the '90s that I just could not find a way to do it. Well, shows like this, uh, you know, do what we can to help remedy that in terms of America. <laughs> but uh, I want to mention I made a list here, Stevie, of some of the uh, funk tracks that you've covered over the years, just so viewers have a, a, a real good handle on sort of, you know, your sensibility in that area. And I mean, the, the versions you did of Groove Line, and we mentioned Get to Your Ear Hole, Body Slam, uh, oh, yeah. Get Away, The Earthman of Fire Track, Hit It yeah. and Quit It, Funkadelic, uh, Pumping It Up, P-Funk All-Stars, which is kind of a little yeah. different version that you do, and yeah. uh, Soul Power, James Brown. Um, oh, yeah. So, I mean, what do those kinds of uh, songs and, and tracks mean to you? Well, let me just tell you. When I was trying to figure out how to make what is the Stevie Solace sound, all I was listening to when I remember in 1987 I was in London, and uh, there used to be a club on Wednesday nights called the Wag. And in London you go like just like LA, certain nights of the week you go to certain places. And I would go to the Wag, and and I hadn't really been up on all my James Brown. And what they had were doing in 1987 in the UK was. DJs were taking all these old funk songs like, you know, I believe in nickels and all this shit and all the James Brown shit. And they were adding big funky kick drums in them and they were spinning them at the clubs. And so all of a sudden, man, I'm listening to Soul Power. And everyone's dancing. I mean, it's you danced all night and it was all James Brown. And I said, I'm going to take James Brown drum beats. The harder they come off color code is pretty much, you know, Sex Machine or, or Soul Power with uh, hard rock guitars on top. It's pretty much what it is. You know, tell your story walking, um, back from the living, is... That's it. It's sex machine. You know what I mean? It's like, but with rock guitars, man. And that was my concept. So those records were super, super, super important to me because um, and when I would cover those songs, it was purely as a fan. And also knowing that a lot of my rock and roll fans, especially in Germany and stuff, may not know that stuff. And, uh, you know, I just thought it had those songs were so great. They had to be done. A great song should be put out, I think. You know? Yeah. And it's great to just help keep them alive, you know. And, and, um, and I saw some recent videos. Well, I don't know how recent they are, relatively recent. But that uh, you did on some of those tracks with uh, Jarrah Harris from Slapback. Uh, how did you get connected with him? And uh, he's he's a beast, man. He's a, be a beast. So Jarrah is from Orange County, and I'm from San Diego. So I had a house on the beach in Carlsbad, and I had a house on the beach in L.A., and Jarrah lived in, right in the middle. And I used to – first of all, Jarrah got signed to Warner Brothers, and they had heard hardware, believe it or not, Warner Brothers, and thought, this is really cool. You should check this out, Jarrah Harris. You should maybe work with this guy, Stevie Solace, to produce your record. And Jarrah's like, who the fuck is that? Fuck that guy. You know, Jarrah's very much Jarrah. If you know Jarrah, Jarrah's all about Jarrah's vision, right? Which is awesome. So Jarrah said, no, I don't even want to meet the guy. So I never even met him. And so I started hearing about him, seeing these videos from in 95. I took the whole summer of 95 off. I had remodeled my house in Carlsbad on the water, and I spent the whole summer on the beach. It was one of the greatest summers of my life. First time I had lots of money. I had money coming in. I knew that I had a tour coming when the, when the summer was over. You know, everything was lined up. Like My life was like I could finally relax. I didn't have to work. I was working like a fiend for those those six years of just nonstop world tour, world tour, coming back, album, album, world tour, world tour. And um, I heard about Jerry Harris, and I saw him play in a – in a, in a funky cover band that he would sometimes do covers. And he was the bass player. And I was like, his bass was like, bam, bam, bam. And I was like, I knew the difference because I'd worked with Bootsy and I'd worked with the real guys. And I was like, that guy's amazing. But he would barely talk to me. Barely talk to me. And he was also kind of shy, Jared. And so 
I start trying to get him to come play on something. He's like, nah, I can't make it. Nah, I can't make it. Nah, I can't make it. And um, one time I sat in with him and that funk man, and I did this crazy wah-wah, weird DJ, weird solo thing. And he was like looking at me. Then he decided, okay, I'm going to come and check you out. And I got him to come up and play um, finally on an album in the late 90s called Shapeshifter. And he showed up and played on it. I was cutting in L.A. And he hated me because I made him read. You know, Jared's the kind of guy that does it, does it one time and that's good and it's done. And I made him recut the shit like 100 times, right, to get what I wanted. He thought I was crazy. You can ask him. He thought I was certifiably out of my fucking mind. He said, he said I never want to work with that guy again, he said to himself. But then he heard the record when it came out. And he was like, people were like, wow. And he's like, wow. And he called me back and goes, he goes, dude, I thought you were fucking crazy. But now I realize. And then that started our relationship. So Jared then started touring with me. I took him on tour. See, in Fuji Rock 99, I took Juan Alderetti, who was the, became the drummer of the Mars Volta. Uh, after that, I started taking Jared Harris everywhere with me. And Jared, Jared never makes a mistake. He doesn't drink. He doesn't, doesn't smoke. doesn't do drugs. He played everything perfect every night. And, and, and like a monster. And he and he was my bass player on tour for the longest, longest time. So yeah, yeah Jerry Harris, Jerry Harris and me are, 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 are like brothers. I love Jerry Harris. Yeah. But it took me for to crack that nut, man. It was like really a tough. He was a tough cat to get into. He could have been hugely famous. He turned down gigs with everybody. Everybody. That's how much he believes in his slapback music. Yeah, and their first album had Bootsy on it too. So there's that. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you what he did, Jerry Harris, Jerry, crazy Jerry Harris. Are you out of your mind, Jerry Harris? When you record Bootsy Collins, he has a three amplifier setup. Okay, this is his thing. That's the Bootsy sound. So when you hear that, what moves around all over the stereo, right? Because he has three amps. You have to pan one right, you have to pan one left, and you put one up the middle. And it's this whole weird thing. So when he moves, it moves. That's that thing you hear when it's moving all over the stereo, right? It sounds like two guys playing. Right? Well, Jared says, fuck that. And he panned them all mono. He just put it on the record mono. It's Bootsy. And it's like, you missed the whole effect of what Bootsy's doing, right? So then Bootsy, I think, was kind of like, oh, well. Yeah. So Jared was Jared. Jared was his own worst enemy, probably, for his earliest years of his career. But it's a good thing that he was so focused on what he wanted to do, but it would have been a better thing for him if he could have. I was focused too, but I was smart enough to say, like, Okay, I'm gonna listen to everything you have to say because you're badass, and then I'm gonna, and then people are gonna think I invented it, right? And that's what happened. People, I got a lot of credit for shit that the greats like Scheider and Mudbone and 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 Michael Hampton, all those guys were doing when when it was really their their stuff, and I was sort of plagiarizing my own version of it, and I was getting famous for it, right? But really, the people who knew would say to me, dude. dude you must listen to fucking, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I go, of course. And, but I never denied it. I, of course I do. I worship those people. And I still worship, the, you know, I surround myself with the greatest people in the world. And, I, and, I, and I'm a fan. And I have no shame, no problem saying it, no ego. And, and I wish Jarrah would have done that more. And he would have probably been a superstar right now. Yeah, he's a multi-instrumentalist talent, too. I mean. I play anything. Matt Sorum told me, okay, so Matt Sorum, you know who Matt Sorum is from Guns N' Roses? Yeah. The mm -hmm. Velvet Revolver. Matt, Matt told me, Matt grew up and went to the same high school as Jarrah, but Matt was older than Jarrah. So Matt dated Jarrah's older sister who sang in the, in, the, in, the, in the Crystals or whatever that band. She sang in that one of them bands, you know, the old famous R&B bands when they came back. And she's a badass singer. She was, and she sang in Jarrah's band, um, his sister. Well, Matt took her to the prom. And Matt used to have a big white afro. And um, he was a drummer. And he thought he was a badass. And he, Matt Sorum said to me, one day you hear somebody playing drums in the back room. It was like... All this shit. And he was like, wow, what's that? Who is that? He said he opened the door and it was like it was like a six-year-old kid doing it. And he said it was Jared. He was like seven or eight or some shit, right? And he oh. said he just fucking almost quit. He said, I'm almost, I'm going to give up. He almost gave up the drums because Jerry Harris fucked his head up so bad. He was like a little kid and he was just crushing him, crushing him. Wow. And, 
And Matt almost gave up drumming. If you ever talked to Matt Sorum, ask him about that. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah sl Slapback, though, I, I'd seen them a number of times in Los Angeles, but one of the times was at the Key Club, which is the same club that before we went on air, I mentioned I had seen Nickelback do like a show uh, case. Um, and that's Nickelback, not Nickelback. Thank you. That's uh, why we stopped the name Nickelback. Yeah, but I think you guys were first, right? Or well, We were way first. We were way first. Yeah. And then one of the Nickelback came up to Bernard Fowler in LA one night. We were at the Sunset Marquee or something. He goes, hey, man, I love your band, man. I'm in the band Nickelback. Bernard's like, fuck off. You know, he walked off. You know, Bernard hated Nickelback. I love you know, it's weird. Is everyone says they hate Nickelback, but they've sold like a gazillion records. It's like nobody admits it. I never liked Nickelback. I, I met the singer a ton of times. I think he's the nicest guy, a Chad. And, and I met, I think, one of the other guys in Hawaii recently, and he was super nice. Nothing personal. I fucking hate that band. You know what? I want to see you down with your pants around your ankles or whatever the stupid lyrics and shit. It's like, I can't deal with it. But uh, yeah, that's why we changed the name. Well, you know what? I mean, I to me, this was one of the, right up there, is one of the best hard rock albums of, of the 90s. I mean, it's really, really solid. If anyone who likes Zeppelin and, you know, funky rock and really hard rocking and, and some of the like Soundgarden-y kind of stuff and all that stuff, um, it's on here, man, and it kicks butt. Well, we were doing that stuff when it was happening. You know what I mean? It was, it was like what was going on. What happened was I had a in '94. Again, the, the album "Back from the Living" with the song "Start Again" was gigantic for me. I got into a bidding war. I got my own label deal. Um, it was just massive. "Start Again" was a huge hit for me around the world. Tell your story, walk in and born the Mac, and um, I got this deal with Warner Brothers. East West, I think they were called, to, that I could develop acts, and if so, they would look at them and they would sign them. I got like it's called a first look deal or something like that, where they gave me a development deal where I could develop acts. Right? I ended up having one later with Virgin, where I developed Chris Cornell's brother, Peter Cornell, actually. But this was the thing. So they said to me, Stevie, if you could do a rock band, what would you want to do? And of course, I could have done a rock band with Warner's behind me with anybody. And what do I do? I mean. I, I get a, I get my favorite singer who happens to be an African American, and it's a kiss of death in the '90s for rock and roll. I don't care what anyone says, and I saw it firsthand. You know, um, I could, I couldn't have done anything more to make myself have a harder road. Here, I wanted to be successful in America so bad. You know, I could have got somebody great like Rob Lamoth, or you know, somebody who really fit that fit that mold that they were looking for. Um, and I get my favorite singer, Bernard Fowler. And I say, I don't care. I'm going to do it with Bernard. And so already I'm, I'm, I'm making myself almost hard enough in the world to make it in America again. Because an African-American singer in rock and roll was really, I mean, we were a racist country. I mean, I'm not, and I don't mean to say that negative. I mean, it's more systemic. Like everyone's like, I love him. I love him. But I remember I was on the, I was doing radio promotion for the song Love Song off that record. And I was quietly, secretly on a call with Dave Darris, who they called Rambo, who was a radio promo guy. And he goes, let's call blah, blah, blah from this station. They're, they're, they're banging the record in a bunch of cities already. It was on the radio. And uh, he goes, wait, what do you think of that new uh, Nickelback song, Love Song? It's pretty good. Huh? He goes, yeah, it's great. He goes, but I don't know. You think America is ready for a second rock band with a black lead singer? Because Living Color was already popular. And when he, he told me that, I knew right then I'm done. I'm sunk. That's what you're talking about. You're not talking about the music. You're not talking about the song. You're talking about that. I go, I was sunk. It's over. It's over. I knew it right then. I told Bernard and Bernard cried because he put so much into that record. That was his dream album. He always wanted to be a rock singer. I mean, he's been in the Rolling Stones for 35 years. He wants to be a rock singer. He doesn't want to be a stereotype. He wants to be a rock singer with tons of soul. And he does that record. Well, meanwhile, that record comes out. It's on the radio. Sammy Hagar calls me. God damn you, fucking TV. What? And I go, what's wrong? He goes, I heard this song on the radio, man. It was all bluesy and sounded killer, man. I went right to the record store and had my guy buy it for me. It's fucking your record, nickel bag. He goes, if I'd have known that, I would have told you to send it to me for free. I wasted $16, you fucker. You know, it's like people were buying it purely reacting to the music. And you see the cover there. We painted our faces to silver, right? See that? There's a reason for that. Now, I knew that we are going to deal with racism in, in America when it came to rock and roll, right? 
And Bernard and I painted our faces silver because nobody would be able to tell anything about what our ethnicity. Es- what's that? Right? Whatever ethnicity. The word is. Yeah. I'm a ethnicity. I'm a I'm a Native American. Bernard's an African American. And we didn't want anyone to talk about that. We wanted to talk about the music. So we painted our faces silver. So nobody could tell that he was black and I was brown. And that's why we did it. And it worked a lot. It really worked a lot. People had no idea. You know, they just heard that music and said, this shit is rocking. And it was in 94 when we cut uh, uh, Too Many Mountains and Love Song. Uh, you know, all those songs. Originally, it was, uh, and it was originally, the bass player was Maggie Dream's bass player, uh, Lonnie Hilliard played on a lot. We call him Lon, I think. Lon, Lonnie Hilliard played bass on, on, on half the record. Oh, yeah. And then he left because he, he was always uptight and always angry and had all these problems. Um, and we had to move on. And we used TM on the record, on a song or two. We used JD because um, we were recording on New Year's Eve and nobody would come record with us, but JD was the only one that would come because he was such a muso from Berkeley. Right? I'll come play. And then we cut Hot Song for Nowhere that night. And then we had, um, in, in Wimbish, Dougie came and played. And that might have been the first time I played with Doug. Not the first time I knew Doug, but it might have been the first time I recorded with Doug, I think, man. And that was badass. Yeah, and, and you did you do another, I know you had another release with that, but it had some of the previous tracks. And, and then it kind of morphed into the uh, IMFs, right? Yeah, we started calling it the International Motherfuckers. That was a, sort of our name. And um, we we had other songs that didn't come out that we used, and so we'd start releasing them, different mixes and different stuff like that. Um, I mean, that record really, we gave it a good go with that, and people still love that record. People, Young kids write me to this day that still discover my music, and they discover that record especially, and they're like, wow. You know, but, but that was Bernard Fowler's baby. I really focused hard on the writing on that. Uh, I, I was re- made Bernard, and he, he may not appreciate this now or may not think it's true, but I made Bernard be super disciplined on that record. We sat in New York City writing and writing, and we wrote melodies. Love song. Everything had to be just right. Where Bernard was used to a place where he could groove around a lot. We really focused on the songwriting, sticking to these melodies, really on point and he sang them pretty much not exactly the same because he's got too much soul but in that he kept to that framework and that's what made the song so strong so they had those are strong songs right they weren't just cool they were really strong songs yeah strong songs and executed so well um you know uh, frankly i hadn't listened to it as in my collection i had listened to it a couple of years and i listened to it again just getting ready for you again and i was like blown away all over again so yeah yeah it's an record um it was uh i remember mm-hmm. we were cut um the album trying to get it done because we were hoping to open some rolling stones dates and bernard had to fly to brazil for a big rolling stone show we were actually i flew down to mexico city when he was there with the stones and we, we cut uh, ronnie wood played guitar on the record in mexico city and and, uh, you know, we were really gearing this thing up for something special. It was Bernard's baby. Mick Jagger got it. And Jagger, like, asked, can I, can I keep this? And it's like, you know, it, it was what I'm most heartbroken about that record. Because I still had my Color Code albums that were doing really well. I'm heartbroken about that record because it was Bernard's dream record. And I wanted to see that dream come true for him. And people could say, ah, fuck, he's in the Rolling Stones. He's got enough dreams come true. But, you know, no matter what. That was his thing. And to this day, he still talks about it like, man, I really thought that was going to be the one for me. And um, and when you listen to it, you realize it really should have been, you know. Yeah, and not only can he can he execute it and do it on record, but, I mean, on stage, he's a compelling lead, lead guy, too, I think. He's a crusher. You know, we were both out on the David Bowie alumni tour a couple of years back, and, and um, I'd sit there, and I remember him doing a, a Bowie song called Sweet Thing. And I'm standing there playing the guitar and I'm listening to him. And I love Bowie, right? I love Bowie. But he was doing his own version of it. And Michael, Mike Garson was playing that piano on the side. And I was just like, I was in seventh grade listening to Diamond Dogs. And I was in heaven. And Bernard was just like doing that thing. It was just so amazing. He's so amazing. 
and you know, you know, I'm just I'm glad I met him. I'm glad I know. Him. Well, for those who know, you know, they get the benefit. For those who don't, it's their loss, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's everyone's loss, really, isn't it? Um, you know, but I like some of your your rock covers too. You know, um, are interesting choices. Some of them, like Dance Little Sister, or Girls Got Rhythm, or Drain You, or some of the Hendrix stuff, or Bowie. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love because I love all that shit. I remember I cut that Nirvana song live. What happened was I was the album came out and I had met Kurt Cobain because my A and R guy who signed me to Island was one of the first guys on Nirvana, and so he took me backstage and I met met them all, and Kurt was such a kind like a gentle he was like a gentle soul i remember feeling he was so fragile he was like i was sitting on the cooler in the dressing room and he goes hey is, is there a pop in there and like a pop they called soda soda pop and pop i go oh and i said oh, oh thank you so much he was like so sweet kind and gentle and on stage he was just you know i remember standing right on the side of the stage watching nirvana when they first started they were the opening act on the three band no this i'm sorry they were the second act on a three-band bill with Pearl Jam and Red Hot Chili Peppers. And I was on the side of the stage watching, and he, he, he was just captivating me. And so I went out, and sometimes live, I like to do that thing like, you know, some guys like to do it. I like to play some covers, man. So I remember I was playing in Japan, and I did a Kiss cover of Detroit Rock City, and then I did a Nirvana cover of Drain You. And to me, they all made sense. It all worked for me. And my crowd, my audience loved it. But it was just, for me. It was just super fun, you know. I was doing it because it was fun. I wasn't trying to be like, you know, I didn't give a shit. Kiss had nothing to do with Nirvana, and I didn't give a shit about any of that kind of stuff. I just loved doing it, and it was fun, you know. Yeah, it's I mean, some Detroit, Detroit Rock City and Drain You. Where do they go together? But for me, it worked. Yeah, it doesn't seem calculated. It just seems genuine. You know, that's what makes it so good. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I was just having fun. <laughs> So, you know, in your style, you know, you, you are so adept at rhythm with the right hand and you can also do the lead stuff. You know, for an aspiring player who wants to be able to do funk rock and be able to, you know, straddle those two things, what would you say is maybe a, a key thing to master or focus on? You know, the key is if you really listen to the great guitar players, the great guitar players, Eddie, Jimmy Page, Joe Perry, Link Ray, Jesse Ed Davis, um, Slash. I've really grown to love Slash. Um, the right hand. You cannot be a good lead guitar player if you can't play rhythm. If you, if you, if there's all these guys that do. You know, I can't stand the band Extreme, but I, I think Nuno's one of the greatest guitar players I've ever heard. You know, and and he's got a great right hand. You know, he's got uh, he's got a great right hand. You know, he, it's the right hand that that makes this all. Otherwise, you're just you're, you're exercising, right? Those guys that do this, there's guys that you see them on YouTube, man. I can't do any of that. I remember George Lynch. George Lynch said to me one time, he goes, "These guys come up to me and they're like, dude, you're my biggest influence. I mean, I want to know." And he's like, he goes, "You're playing some shit. I never, I can't even conceive of playing. Why, why are you talking to me? You know." And, and, and maybe because they can't get that soul. There's a soul that's got to come through. And I think that soul comes through in the heart and in the right hand. Because the right hand, if you're, if you're a right-handed guitar player, the right hand is what, it's antenna that sends the information of your heart and soul out into the neck. This stuff just is like, is, is, what's, is the language, it's speaking. But this sends out, the laser beam it's the force right it's the it's the jedi force yeah and a little wah-wah pedal doesn't hurt either once in a while well wah-wah is an extension of, of like it's like a, you have your your right leg your left leg your right arm your your your, your left arm and your penis and then you got a wah-wah so you got six appendages <laughs> are there a couple of more recent players that maybe have come out this century uh, in the 2000s that impress you or you just really like it's hard because i'm not seeing anybody that's doing anything that i haven't already seen a million times right uh i'm not 
You know, everybody, when, you know, I did the first original movie, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, right? I don't know if you know that. And I did the solo at the end, the George Carlin solo's me. And, and then, then the, the movie became huge. Then they, they, for Bill and Ted 2, Steve Vai was the hot guy. So they got the hottest guy, Steve Vai. When they got me, it wasn't the hottest guy. It was the movie. No one gave a shit about the movie. I was just a staff producer for Kirshen Mom, and I could play. And I, so I scored the movie, and then I did the end scene. And, uh, but by now, it was known as a guitar player cool thing, so they got Steve Vai for Bill and Ted too. He was the greatest. He's the fucking greatest, right? And so they just recently did Bill and Ted 3, and I was getting a million emails. Are you doing it? Are you not? I'm not doing it. I, was like, I don't even know. I don't know nothing about it. And I don't want to do it. I did one already. I'm not going to try to recreate something I did by accident that came out magical, right? And uh, they hired a guy called Tosin, Tosin, Tosin or Tosin, something like that. Some uh, some brother that everyone seems to really like. And he's supposed to be rad. I think he's got like eight or 10 or 12 or 15 string guitar, some crazy shit. And uh, he's supposed to be badass. And I kind of listened to some things that he was doing. But again, it was kind of like, it was just kind of like some shit I already heard before too done really well don't get me wrong and i mean no 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 insults the guy's on another level and you know he's done he's thinking on another level which is what you need but i don't know that i just don't want to hear fucking ching, 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 ching. I, you know and i want to hear catfish playing sex machine and i'm fucking and i'm fucking on the dance floor you know what i mean i don't know did you hear the new Twenty Four Seven Spies album that they put out? Yeah, I really like it. I had I had him on I had him on the show recently. Mind blowing! That one song they do, uh, I forget what it's called, man, but it's a long song. Oh, is, and, it, is it called Epic or maybe? Uh, I want to thank you for the something like that. Oh my God! You know, I toured with Twenty Four Seven Spies in nineteen ninety months, and we had so much fun. And Rick Skater played on uh, my Back from the Living album. That's him on Born to Mac. And uh, that record blew my mind guitar wise. You know, what, uh, what, uh, Jimmy Hazel. Jimmy and, and Rick. And, and they had uh, my man from, uh, who passed away recently um, on guitar. Oh, uh, Ron, Ron, um, Drayden. Drayden. Yeah. I know that had to be Ronnie Solo in on there, I think. Uh, I don't know. But it, that record really, that really fucked my head up, that record. That song, I thought it was just mind blowing. I would edit it down some. I thought it kind of went on a bit. So you, you know, when the song goes on too long, you sort of, you, you know, if you if you're a guy and you got a ten inch penis and, and you just flash somebody, they're like, what the fuck was that? But if you leave it out all day, they start to get used to it. And so when you have a song that's too long, you start to get used to it. And you you start to forget how amazing it is. And but man, I thought that was pretty mind blowing. That grabbed my ear. That was the first thing in a long time to grab my ear. I mean, remind me of something that I'm not thinking of right now. You listen to stuff. Who should I be hearing? Oh, well, you know, as far as not having heard it before, that's really hard to say. Um, I think of bassists like Mono Neon. He's pretty hot on, on bass, and he's doing a lot of experimental stuff. Uh, Guitar-wise, just a player that I really like is uh, uh, Kingfish, doing the blues uh, in the tradition of, like, you know, Buddy Guy kind of blues, but he's only, I don't know if you've seen him, He's only he just turned 22, big heavy set guy. Uh, I love he, that. He's really, really good, and, and he sings like he's, you know, a 65-year-old blues guy. <laughs> That's the key, right, is the vocals at the end of the day. Are, you know, at the yeah. end of the day, you, you, you can, if you could, that's what made Stevie Ray Vaughan so great. You know, people talk about Stevie Ray Vaughan, wee, wee. but really, the songs were amazing, and his voice was amazing, and you need that. You know, if, you're, if Van Halen didn't have David Lee Roth, maybe Eddie would just be like Ingve. Ingve's not nearly, he's a better guitar player, or you know what I mean? But people don't know him. What got you known was the songs and the lead singer. Let's face it, every guitar player out there, you got to have a great lead singer, man. Yeah, well, Stevie Ray, just the tone also, yeah. Ugh. The tone? But if he just had the tone, then he'd be one of those great blues guitar players playing with somebody else. Get that tone, then he had the song. I mean, come on, man. Those are some great songs. Great. Yeah. And, you, and you talk about heavy on the rhythm. Yeah. Yeah, and rhythm, right hand. Girls can dance to the blues all of a sudden, right? <clears throat> Shit. The right hand makes it sexy. And I guess funk music is what makes things sexy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. When you look back on, on everything at this point, Stevie, what, what would you say you're most proud of accomplishing? 
my film Rumble. It changed the the world. It's uh, you know I got nominated for an Emmy. So I'm an official Emmy loser. My favorite line now. I'm an official Emmy loser. I got nominated for an Emmy award. I um, I spent a lot of years trying to make that thing happen. It, I, I wanted to make a film that was going to inspire indigenous people that that greatness is possible. Uh, and what ended up happening was a changed written history by accident. I did completely alone. Uh, but, you know, the film changed written history. Uh, and now that subject's being taught as American history in, in universities across America and in high schools. And uh, and a lot of these guys got credit that they never you know got before. And, and it, so it's my it's probably my proudest moment. Uh, other than that, my my favorite moments playing with Mick Jagger, playing with playing with my idols, playing with Steven Tyler, Mick Jagger, Rod Stewart, um, George Clinton, Bootsy. You know, all the great legends. Michael Hutchins, I love that. You know, he died. Uh, the record that I did with him came out right after he died, actually, which is really a shame. He played his last gig with me and Bernard in the, uh, the IMFs. Michael Hutchins did. Wow. He sat with us and we did a Bowie song, you know. Uh, you know, my, my, my most thing I'm most proud of is being able to play with the most legendary musicians in the world. Even if people say, who the hell is that guy up there on the stage with those guys? The cool thing is the guys know me. And that makes me very proud that the best musicians in the world um, respect me. And that um, is my probably my crowning thing that I love the most. You turned out to be, you know, a bit of a renaissance guy, though, with all the things that you've gotten involved with. You know, where does all that energy uh, come from and the willingness to just try stuff? Money. When you got free time and you got money, you don't got to worry about getting food. You can do all kinds of shit, right? It's like, I got to be, let's be honest. If I didn't have money in the bank, if I didn't make money, when I got money, I don't have to go to, I don't gotta have to take a job. I never take a job I don't want to take. I never take that job playing on the love boat on a Saturday night, um, playing uh, Celebrate, everyone Celebrate. If I'm going to play Celebrate, I'm going to play with Shawnee Mac, Quillers, and, and, and the Cool and the Gang, and I'm going to play Celebrate with them for fun, for free. You know what I mean? Which I do sometimes. Um, so having... Being able to, to have money has made me have the freedom to think about more songwriting, to have the freedom to, to write a book, to make movies, to write movies. Um, and, and I know it sounds petty and shitty, but it's really given me... I never did a job for money that I didn't regret. Like, for instance, I, I took a job... I didn't take a job. I took an endorsement deal once with Washburn Guitars because they offered me $100,000 a year. And in, in the 90s, that was a fortune to play a guitar. And then I got the guitars and they were all wrong. Grover Jackson designed them. Then he left the company. It was a disaster. I mean, I went to Germany to sign autographs and all the guitars said Steve Salas model. And my name is Stevie Salas. It, and Jimmy Dunlap laughed in my face. And I had made a deal with the devil. I took all that money and I didn't want to give it back. And so I tried from that point on to remember that and never take the money over the substance. But money has given me freedom to create. So it's an enabler, but not a um, directive force, sort of. Never directive. If, yeah. if I use if I used money as my as my motivation, I would have taken. Some, I would have made a lot of mistakes. I might have been in an eighties eighties metal band and been written off in nineteen ninety two, ninety four, or whatever it was. The year that you know Nirvana blew up. Blew up. If I would have taken, there's a lot of gigs I didn't take. You know, the one thing I learned from from George and Bootsy and P Funk and 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 Fowler and and Wimbish and all us guys, we have and Ivan Neville. We all have this group, and Ivan Neville used to call us. Uh, Ivan Neville said he said like, yeah, you know, you know, when you see the mafia, you got like, hey, he's a friend of mine. He's a friend of mine. So, my my man said this story. I saw he was like. Steve Salas, he's like, you know, he's a friend of mine, you know, and you get in a small club, and in that club, you got, you know, the Rolling Stones, and you got, you know, Doug Wimbish, and you got Fowler, and it's a private club, and you want to be in that club, because there's cats that come up to us, and we're always nice, but they ain't in the club, right, you know what I mean, and so, if I would have taken the wrong gig, some Goonie Cornball gig, I wouldn't be in the club no more, Mick Jagger would not have called me to play guitar with him. If I was the guy who played in some lame band that he, he thought was lame, he wouldn't want that association, you know. 
um, I'll tell you a story. And I don't know if Richie Cotson would appreciate it or not, but I love Richie like my brother. But Richie took a gig with Poison when we were really young. And it was a big gig. And, and it cost him a lot of problems later on. Later on, he's an amazing musician, amazing guitar player, amazing singer, amazing looking. He gets an audition with, I think it was Trent Reznor for Nine Inch Nails. And um, I think it was Trent, yeah. And he comes down and they didn't want to audition him because he is some guy they thought was some 80s corny guy. But he's not. He's, he's, he's amazing. So he gets the audition. He goes down to plays and Trent Reznor gets him some blown away. Blown away by Richie. And Richie told me that Trent says to him, God, you're so fucking good. I had no idea. Because they wouldn't even give him a chance because of the association with Poison. He goes, I really want to give you this job. I really want to hire you. You look perfect. Everything's perfect. He goes, but I don't know what I'm going to do the first time that I'm on tour. And some magazine guy asked me, so what made you hire the guy from Poison? He goes, I just don't know how I'm going to deal with that. And Richie couldn't get the gig. So you got to really be, you know, you're a musician out there. you got to really think about your associations and where they're going to go with you and how they're going to come back to haunt you. Now, Richie being so good, he outrode that, that stigma because his talent was that high. But very few people have that much talent as Richie Kotzen that can get away with that. And when you don't, you're going to go down and you're going to go down with the ship. So I was lucky that I never made those bad choices. So like being typecast, you know, in a bad sitcom or whatever, and then you never get another good acting gig. It's exactly what it's like, you know what I mean? Image and people's image. Now it's not so important. I took a job with American Idol, and I hated American Idol when it first came out. Matter of fact, I didn't even like it when I took the job. But by the time I took the job in 2006, it was there was no more music business. It was kind of disintegrated. And it was, American Idol was the biggest show in the world and i got a call to come in and uh, at that particular time i was just a brand new father becoming a father i thought i better rethink my whole program here i'd already done jagger i'd always done all these things that how nobody's going to be able to say i'm not credible and i took the job and at and it was at that time it was perfect because then Idol was cool all of a sudden. People were like, man, you're doing Idol. It's the biggest fucking show in the world. So all of a sudden, I was like I was Mick Jagger with Mick Jagger again. I was with something huge. I was associated with something huge. Um, you know, I got to sit down and be back on the phone with the Clive Davis again. You know, I was back in the game. I was back in the game when I took Idol. My first act I did was, was Daughtry. And we sold like five million records. So I was associated with something huge again. Um, so I stayed for four seasons. I did Daughtry, Jordan Sparks, which was double platinum. I did... Uh, David Cook, which was platinum, and then I did Adam Lambert, uh, Alice and Irita, and and Chris Allen. All three, I did three of them one year, which was I was I had a whole SIR locked out, and I was a consultant and a music director. And by the time I did that, it couldn't ruin my reputation. It it wouldn't it wouldn't make somebody not hire me because I was like, I do an idol. In fact, it changed. It made people hire me more because they thought I was really a powerful guy in the business. So the timing was okay. Yeah, idol transcended. It's early sort of, you know, you know, it's, oh, it's that, you know, and yeah, it, and yeah it's kind up. of gained some legitimacy along the way somehow. Yeah, it came for me when I took the gig, it came at the right time and it was a big thing and I was able to have some success with it and, um, and make a lot of money. It was a lot of money. Let's face it. I was a dad now, so there's no more screwing around. It's like, I can't no longer sit around and think about the perfect perfect gig and then luckily the gods put that one in front of me and idol was a great one for that because it was only three or four months of my life and it was a ton of dough and it was a ton of visibility and it gave me a really everyone took my phone call again in, in new york and la because i because i was associated with something massive i appreciate all the time that you've given to the show and appreciate all the amazing music that you've contributed for all of our enjoyment and, um, you know, before we end this, I just wanted to make sure, is there anything that you want to get out there, or promote or plug or anything like that? I see my film Rumble. It's free on Amazon Prime. It's now streaming again. It was on HBO Canada. It's streaming across Canada again now. Um, and um, check out my book. If you want to know what it was like to be an unknown kid. And go straight from your high school band to a stadium band with Rod Stewart playing with the greatest musicians on the planet from David Bowie's band and, everything, and know how completely crazy it was. Read my book, When We Were the Boys. You can get it on Amazon. It just came out in Japan this week. It was number one in Japan this week. I was like, yeah. 
Um, and that's about it. Or if you're in Japan, man, check out uh, my shit with the Nava Solace. It's huge, man. And Nava Solace, those records are huge. You know, this year, 2020, uh, last year, was the best year and worst year. I had canceled 90,000 seat tour, which was painful. Um, I had a number one record. My first ever number one record as an artist with me and Nava Solace, uh, Maximum Huevo. I was on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine, Rolling Stone Japan, in 2020, which was my first ever cover of Rolling Stone. Um, and um, I didn't get to, you know, it was just a weird year. So things are still going good. I will say that everybody out there that, you know, I'm 100 years old now. I'm in my 50s now, which, you know, if you would have told me, I remember I was 24 or 23 and I was sitting on the airplane. I, we had a private airplane with Rod Stewart. And he was standing in the hallway of the airplane and I was sitting there looking at him and I thought, He's so fucking old. He was like 42. Was like, and I said to myself, why is he doing this still? He could be retired. He could be living on an island. And now I'm 100 and I'm still doing it too. So, you know, at the time. So you're never too old to fucking get it done. And and me being on the cover of Rolling Stone and having a number one record this year tells me that anything is possible. Congratulations on that and, and everything, really, you know? Yeah. And... Um, okay. Do you think musically uh, you're going to pursue, uh, you know, will IMFs eventually get back out there again? And what else might you do? I have a new deal now on Warner Brothers, so I might actually do that. I'm just really focused on film and TV right now. Um, but we, I think I have like a, some best up packages and a thing called Garage Funk coming out pretty soon. And it's going to be global. It's coming out everywhere. I'm through Warner's. It's funny. All my old shit has become like popular, and to most people, it's still brand new. It's weird. It, it somehow it's still, it doesn't sound dated to people. A lot of it, and I'm so thankful for that. Um, I don't know why it doesn't sound dated because a lot of it's 30 years old, 25 years. Old. I have kids writing me, like, who, "Who are you? I just heard tell your story. Walking this is the best ass shit I've ever heard." I go, "How old are you?" And they go, "Well, that song's older than you." You know, so I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, we'll, well things things come around again, they say. But, you know, also, you didn't use a lot of sort of um, trendy elements, you know, when you're doing that stuff. So that helps. Yeah. It was, a, hit, it was, a, it was a, a blessing and a curse. I stayed fresh, but so fresh that nobody got it until, you know. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Stevie, it's been a pl pleasure. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Truth and Rhythm. A big thank you goes out to our guest as well as to you, the viewer and listener. Also, much gratitude to Pleasure for supplying the show's funky opening and closing music. As a reminder, you can always access the complete list of linked shows by episode at funkinstuff.net. I urge you to support this program and receive the extra benefits along with that by subscribing to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube and sharing it with funk, R&B, and jazz lovers, joining Truth and Rhythm's membership program at Patreon, submitting a donation at funkandstuff.net, buying Everything is on the One, the first guide to funk book at Amazon, shopping at the Funky Things store for cool merchandise at funkandstuff.net, and linking through funkandstuff.net for all of your Amazon purchases. In addition, if you're an artist or anyone seeking proven, results-oriented, professional marketing, PR, writing, or editing consultation or production, check out the media services section at funkinstuff.net. Also, I encourage you to drop me a line at scottg at funkinstuff.net. I love the feedback, suggestions, guest requests, appearance and sponsorship inquiries, and just talking about my favorite subject, groove-based music. For now, and as always, this is Scott Dr. GX Goldfine saying, keep on keep vibing, on vibing to the rhythm of the one.